Mm. Okay. <sighs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone, especially to our speakers, um, Diana Blythe and Alison Murdoch, for some really, really <sighs> interesting things to, to think about. I do want to remind everyone that all of these talks will be archived um, on the Nobel website, um, especially for students and educators. Um, if you want to review, there's been a lot of information that's been shared today. If you want to go back and remind yourselves of some of that information, um, please do so. And please feel free to use any of these materials um, in classes to share and kind of maybe pair some talks and, and discuss um, together. So. Um, Thank you all. Um, I think we're going to do the same kind of thing as we did yesterday and just kind of throw um, the discussion open to all of the panelists to share some thoughts, reactions, maybe tie it back to yesterday. And then um, after a bit, we'll um, start sharing some questions from the audience um, and online. Go ahead. I, I don't mind jumping in there. Um, so I, first, I just wanted to comment and appreciate um, the clarity of the presentations, the accessibility, the fact that it drew us all in wherever our starting points were. So I just wanted to really thank my colleagues for presenting the way that they did. And I hope, I'm sure that you agree. Thank you. I think that's really a, a prerequisite for having good conversation and debate across, across a wider variety um, of people to be able to just have some basic sense of what we're talking about and it presented in that way. Um, so one comment and then one question that i just like to hear any of my colleagues' thoughts around. Um, so the one point I would just say is that in terms of, it was a, it was a fleeting comment um, about um, the use of prisoners in research. And I would just say that, you know, we make bioethical strides, but we can also backslide as well, bioethically. Um, and so, in fact, in the US, there has been recommendations to loosen the regulations around prisoner research, starting in 2006 with the Institute of Medicine's recommendations. And so, I think we all need to stay very alert to the way in which things become, there's consensus built, but then the way that things evolve and can actually, we can actually start to, and I'm saying this as a, 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 in a critical light, I think, regarding prisoner research, where the human rights crisis around mass incarceration is such that we have to think about what it means to, to be included in research as not a straightforward good, when the larger context in which you're being included in biomedical research is so oppressive and also so racially, uh, racially skewed. So the, the, question, the, the question then, just for anyone who has thoughts around it, is I'm um, going back to a really important set of points in Dr. Murdoch's talk around the composition of the, the regulatory committees. I appreciated um, the highlighting that patients were absent um, in that, and I thought that was really alarming. I also really appreciated the point around um, the, the kind of la seeming lack of scientific understanding among those people who were there to represent the lay interests. And so the question I have is understanding the importance of including patient perspectives, understanding that those lay members and representatives should have some scientific understanding about what's going on in the clinic. My question then is what forms of knowledge and experience do clinicians and researchers lack that should also be comprised in those committees? That is, there's an understanding, a common discourse about scientific, the need for scientific literacy among everyone. And so what I'm interested in is what forms of social literacy are necessary on regulatory committees? Who else do we think is, is, should be part of the conversation. And I think that shifts the conversation not only to what researchers and clinicians know, which is vital, but also perhaps what they don't know. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> um, well, let me, let me um, give a, an instance of the, I think, illustrates what you're talking about. Um, we had a talk at our advisory council recently in which a parent 
whose child had Cushing syndrome, which is a rare disease, but a very serious one. And the child went from being a normal appearance to being fairly obese, and nobody recognized that it was Cushing's. And they just kept telling the mother that she was a bad parent because she wasn't monitoring her child's food. And she went to several physicians and kept getting the same basically admonitions, and so they felt incredibly guilty, and yet they're watching their poor child not growing and getting more obese. Finally, somebody recognized what was going on. They began treatment, and the child is basically, you know, under, the disease is under control, normal weight and normal activities and, and all. But the torture that the poor parent went through in not only trying to advocate for the child, but being told by the medical community that it's all her fault, is, it's mind boggling and, and so heart aching, I think. With parent, patient's perspective and parents of children as patients' perspective are very hard for, I think, the medical community to recognize. And, and especially in our country where Physicians are becoming so, having to sort of treat so many so quickly and have little time to talk, and especially around contraceptive uh, advice, counseling, they don't get a proper amount of information. I, I wish, I really wish we could go to a national health service that would have more of the outcome-centered approach yeah. than the fee-for-service <laughs> approach. And, that would be my choice. I'll further complicate your question um, about representation on boards and panels. Um, I, I mentioned in passing that I'm, I'm sometimes asked to, to represent the disability community. Um, and I, I, that, that comes from an experience of people in marginalized um, constituencies being asked to to join these panels and when we do we work incredibly hard to speak up and speak out for our constituency as best we can and quickly realize how tokenized we are mm -hmm. and you know I've just a, a, a yucky example is um, speaking up and speaking out on federal ethics panels for the genome, and then having scientists and others say, I never heard your perspective, it's really moving, why don't you write about it? And I realized that they, certain constituencies of professionals and research and, and so on, don't have a way in the structure of their fields to learn other points of view. And I don't mean to criticize science again, but, uh, but I'm criticizing science. Um, we, we need to have much more cross-dialogue, which is the purpose of this event, so that, there's, that we're minimizing the, the, the exploitation of this process of representing certain constituencies when the voices really are only tokenized. And it's a really hard pathway. And it's, you know, decades, I'm 66, I've been doing this for uh, 30 years, and the progress is incredibly slow, not only to be put on the panels, to be, but to have our voices heard. Right. You know, I just, I don't want to defend scientists too much, but <laughs> there's a lot of information to take in all the time, and we tend to be in silos. And even the egg people don't speak to the sperm people, in my view. <laughs> to try to get them to communicate across those disciplines is amazingly hard. I, I, I think they would like to do that. I think they'd like to find the time to do that. And, I, and uh, we all can benefit from the opinions and exposure and experience of other people. I wish there were more hours in the day to right. be able to find the time to do those things. Mm. I think it's really interesting. Um, 
coming from the perspective of the liberal arts and everything and what a liberal arts institution is meant to do, a lot of that work has to happen, not you know, when you're an expert and you're kind of adding on these extra perspectives, but as a student in the classroom, like this, the groundwork needs to be laid. And so sometimes students want to rush through their gen eds. It's like, okay, I got to check off this box and that box for sciences or history or whatever. Um, but the whole point of that process is to give students some kind of foundation so that when they go off into the world, when they, you know, they kind of engage in their own area of expertise, that they can come back and be like, oh, there was a class that I had to take but really learned a lot from that now allows me to add in these, um, to take into account these other perspectives. And so, um, so this is exactly the kind of conversation that we should all be having across disciplines. And I don't think it's only scientists that have this issue. Defin it's all of us, right, mm -hmm. that have this. I, I have a similar... A similar experience um, to share, but the deficit of not being into liberal arts. At UC Berkeley, I got a grant a number of years ago to run a small seminar for advanced undergraduates called Regeneration, looking at reproduction stem and stem cell research and um, genomics. And I took, my, a colleague and I ran it, and we interviewed, we, students applied, and we took half students from the STEM fields and half from the social sciences and humanities and professional schools. Um, it was an app, and half the students had visible and invisible disabilities, and half didn't. And uh, as far as we know, it was entirely self. You, it was entirely voluntary how you chose to identify. Um, but that was how we structured the the um, class. But se several of the STEM students had almost no gaps in their schedule, so they literally often couldn't get there. That, so it was something as basic as the way that the undergraduate education was structured. There was no time in the day that they could come to the seminar, so we had to swap out some alternates for some of the people we'd originally chosen. And that's the kind of thing that more of the liberal arts ethos, I think. Mm -hmm. But it was a fabulous seminar, very, very interesting. Yeah. Great. If we could bring the discussion back to the two specific we, um, talks we heard this morning, I would love to hear from um, all the, the panel um, members up here um, if there were any <coughs> additional kinds of um, things that, that you would like to, to talk about before we throw it open to the audience questions. I'm, I'm really curious um, from Allison. I'm, I'm curious. Um, when papers first came out with Franken babies, things like that, and then after that there was the Nuffield Council decision, things can go ahead. Did things come full circle again? How did the papers report on that decision and, and how were things communicated back after that decision? The, the reports that came back um, from the science journalists so you've got two issues when it comes to the newspapers. You've got the actual report that you go and read, and for the, uh, the news stories on the television, where they have you know, a long session and you get five, ten minutes to talk about it, actually got quite reasonably well-informed um, reviews then, where they talk to different people, they looked at both the ethics, they talked to patients, they talked to clinicians, and you get a, a broad view. Um, with exceptions, I think, probably of the headline from the particular paper that I showed you, which was an extreme, and they always do that. <laughs> but the, the science editors don't write the headlines. And the purpose of newspapers and television is to sell their medium. So they have, when I talked about what I call third-party interests, I put the media on that as well, because they do have an interest, but their motivation is different. Their motivation is to get people to buy their papers. So we need to be clear when we give them a voice to understand why they're giving that voice, why they're using that opinion, and, and read it that way. But um, I have, we challenge, we try to challenge about the three parent headline, which is just horrible, and it is so demeaning to the whole meaning of parenthood. Um, but eventually, the, the Science Media Center, which is a UK organization that um, sort of corrals us as scientists and clinicians when there are big issues like this so we can present to face-to-face -to -face at meetings with the science editors so we can be sure that our message is getting over clearly. Um, their message was that you're not going to win that one. They like that headline. It sells the papers. Just forget it. Go with it. So we have to go with that headline. Yeah. So I'm still blown agenda. away by the video which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a question. I thought that mitochondrial DNA 
um, was the place where you got back for generations to be able to determine whether or not that that was the most highly conserved and if you were trying to determine whether somebody, you know, parentage yeah. went back many, many generations you used mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. Is that contribute to anything or is that true or not true? No, that is true. And that's because, you know, as explained, even in, in my family, you get intact mitochondrial DNA. But there are different types of DNA. So like blood groups, you get different types in different areas. And um, you can trace back human origins through centuries by saying this person must have come from Africa or they must have come from Indonesia. So you can trace back origins that way. Um, so you're messing all that up now? With the, like, so you were messing, you're all, messing up. all that well, up? You're messing like, all that up. Really yes. greatly confuse people <laughs> in the future? <laughs> Except that we're messing it up for people who, in the process, have acquired an abnormality. You know, spontaneous abnormalities occur in mitochondria all the time. So we're never going to cure it completely. There will be some people who will develop a problem. But once that problem is developed, it then gets passed down through the generations. So, yeah, there's, there's still a bit to sort out there. But that's how you follow it through. And um, you can follow the male through by the Y chromosomes for the same, in the same way. Do you make any kind of effort to match your donors to your recipient couples? There's been a lot of discussion about that because there is some relationship between... Um, you require some genes on the nucleus of a cell in order to activate the mitochondria. So there is some relationship. And there was some fear from mouse studies that if you, if you didn't match the mitochondria, then you might get malfunction. That has largely now been thrown out because the mouse studies were done on inbred mice, very specific um, strains. Whereas human beings, we are what we call an ultimate wild type. We mm -hmm. interbreed. All right. So from that basis, there's no evidence that you get incompatibility. Um, you can meet, people can breed with people from different ethnic groups and you don't have mismatches. And as I showed in my slide, the, my granddaughter's nuclear DNA is only 3% of her great-great-great-grandmother's. Mm -hmm. So if there was an incompatibility, mm -hmm. it would have shown up dur during that time. So now um, we are not specifically aiming to match, but it's one of those things that will be looked at and will be followed through. Do you also look to see whether the, the continental origins, for example, whether some of the information that's given in the mitochondrial DNA is, is a match in the same way that you might match phenotypic things in picking an egg or sperm donor? Yeah, the, the, the function of the mitochondria is purely to produce energy. So you, you don't, you can't match you don't try that. to have them get the, the same results out of a genetic ancestry test. No. 23 and me is going yes. to be really screwed up. <laughs> exactly. You don't try no. for that at all. No. 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 There are a couple of other questions about uh, sort of some of the more technical a aspects of mitochondria that we might throw in here, just in a clump, if I could. Um, why are, uh, this from a high school student, I think, why are mitochondrial diseases only passed on by the mother? What traits, and maybe you've talked about this, what traits are coded for by mitochondrial DNA? And then um, getting into the matter of mitochondrial transfer, are there any circumstances where the donor mitochondria could be rejected by the patient, and how would that affect the embryo or the mother? Um, well, I think, as explained, it, it goes down the maternal line because it's the mitochondria in the egg that matter. Uh, mitochondria and sperm are lost at fertilization, so it's passed down intact through the maternal line. Um, I'm beginning to lose track of what the other questions were. Um, <laughs> what traits are coded for? The, the function of the mitochondria is simply to produce energy. All right. So there are lots of different things that can go wrong with the genes in the mitochondria. So you can get different forms of mitochondria disease. Some women could have all the mitochondria abnormal, but it'd be a relatively minor abnormality. So there's malfunction, but it's not, it's not doesn't mean that they don't function at all. Um, and the way that mitochondria are distributed through the body will determine the disease that they get. So if, for instance, you have um, all your abnormal mitochondria in your muscles, mm. that's when you start getting muscular dystrophy type problems. Mm -hmm. If it's in your pancreas, that's when you can start getting some forms of, of, of diabetes. And it's more than that in that sometimes they don't, sometimes they present at birth, 
sometimes they don't present till later in life because mitochondria um, are dividing and, and growing all the time. So there might be different, weights at, different rates at which the mitochondria divide. You might have a, a small number of mitochondria in a cell that, that are abnormal, then they, they divide faster. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not a mitochondrial expert, I have to say, and I'm, I realize I'm very quickly getting into deep waters here. So um, <laughs> people want to know the details of mitochondrial disorders. Um, you know, my colleague, Dr. Temple, is better placed than that. But the more now we understand about mitochondrial disease and the problems that are associated with it, the more research is going in into it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it doesn't get sexy stuff onto mm -hmm. the <laughs> you, would you feel comfortable sketching out uh, the answer to that last question? Are there circumstances where the donor could, mitochondria could be rejected? Well, I think this is the issue that we were talking about, is that there is a relationship between the, the gene, okay. the, the function of the mitochondria and the function of the nucleus. So if there is an incompatibility problem, then theoretically, yes, it could be rejected. Um, but all the evidence we would say at the moment, all the theoretical evidence, when you do these things, you don't just say, well, We'll have a go and we'll see. You do a risk assessment first. You work out all the different steps, all the things that are happening, and work out, well, what would happen if? And you look at the evidence, indirect evidence and direct evidence to see. Um, and at some point, you say, well, we've done the best we can. The next thing we can do, the only thing we can do is to do it in humans. There have been primates born from similar techniques without problem, not a lot but enough to feel that we, we, we need now to move into, into humans. Okay. The problems with primates in terms of reproduction is that they are our ne nearest um, um, representatives in the animal world, but they are still a long, long way for us in reproductive terms. Mm -hmm. Just to give you some figures, um, a baboon, the chance of conception, the first one cycle of, fertility, of, 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 of intercourse, about 80% chance of conception. In humans, you're probably down at about 15%. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And that's our nearest relative. Wow. Great, thank you. We also had another question from um, a high school student who was wondering about that really, <laughs> that, that video that was so kind of exciting. Um, and this person was asking, when transferring the nuclei, um, or what happens to the puncture in the egg? Can that cause complication within the development of the embryo or the ability to fertilize the egg at all? Is it possible that there's more than one sperm that could get in? And so I think like, if, and, and so um, if we could maybe just clarify okay. just that basic information of like what happens to the, the, the puncture, I guess. Um, well, the first thing that happens is that because we're doing pronuclear transfer, the sperm bit's already been done, mm -hmm. okay? we do a procedure called ICSI to achieve fertilization, which is where you pick up a single sperm and inject it into the egg. If you do normal IVF, you put about 100,000 sperm with each egg. All right, so you would have that egg, as you saw it on the video, with lots of sperm spinning around, and we wouldn't want to do that because we wouldn't want any more sperm to get in, so we only put one sperm in. The, the shell around the outside of the egg, which is called the zona, it is an egg shell, um, when we do the ICSI procedure to put the sperm in, we make a hole because we have to make a hole with a needle to go through. But you can do that with just the needle going through. For these procedures, because it's a slightly bigger pipette that you're using, you need to make a little hole in the techniques that you can use. There's different things you can use. You can use a laser to actually make a tiny hole in, in that. Um, these techniques of actually making holes in the zona have been used in fertility practice for many, many years. Um, it's, they call it assisted hatching, because as the egg then goes on and divides and grows, there are initially, when it gets to the blaster stage, it's still the same size as it was at two cells, but eventually it gets bigger and bigger, the shell expands, expands, and it hatches. It literally hatches, it just, the, set, the embryo comes out. Um, there is evidence from IVF treatment that hatching may not be the best thing, because there's an increased risk that a bit of the embryo will come about too early, huh. and then you can get identical twins, okay? And that's not good news, because more things can go wrong. So in the IVF field now, we probably don't really recommend assisted hatching to be done. But those techniques are fairly standard. They're standard if you're doing PGD, if you want to take a single cell out to do a genetic diagnosis, you're making a hole in the zona to do that. So again, when you're doing your risk analysis, you're saying, well, in order to do the transfer, we're going to have to make a hole. 
is making a hole going to be a problem? Where's the previous evidence? The previous evidence is we've done this lots of times in IVF before. We know the risks. We know the benefits. We think, therefore, that that particular the process is not going to be a problem. Great. Thank you. And if we could switch gears a little bit, um, we have some questions regarding um, um, contraception. And one person would like to know kind of what you think that male contraception will do to the, the rate of STIs. So um, will this have effect on STI transmission? Will condom use, like, you know, where will condom use fit in that? Is this something that, you know, people who work in the area of contraception, do you think about the public health, you know, kind of consequences of maybe people saying, well, pregnancy is our main concern. Um, let's, let's just go with that, and we don't have to bother with condoms anymore. Well, I think it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, it's probably true that there will be less condom usage if men are using a method of contraception, but it would be stupid for them to have <laughs> a new relationship with somebody that, where they're not using a condom. Uh, so I think, it, again, would go with counseling. Mm -hmm. And you would say to the individual who's using the contraceptive method, by the way, this does not protect you from uh, transmission of, of disease, and therefore you need to protect yourself. Uh, but once people are in a long-term trusting relationship, there tends to be not as much condom usage or um, you know, other options prevail. Right. So I, I think it's something people worry about. It's not a good reason to not develop a male contraceptive, right. but it is something that people should be aware of. And right. it would be nice if we could find a way of controlling for those diseases in other ways. Right. It reminds me of, um, Allison, I think you said yesterday that, um, you know, these things are not mutually exclusive, that we need to work on the, the medical side of things, the scientific side of things, but also pay attention to the social aspects, right? Um, and actually, Gus Davis did a, a survey, which I think you mentioned, kind of trying to access what public attitudes are towards male contraception. And, um, and we found that, you know, 80% of women would be in long-term relationships, would be, you know, happy to have male um, contraceptives be used um, in conjunction with their own usage. Um, but in short-term relationships, 30% of women were like, I would still like condoms. <laughs> so I think those conversations need to be happening um, you know, just kind of across the board. And, you know, there can be an additive effect as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the condom gives extra assurance um, if, if one is trying to be... And I, as I've said before, I don't think that women will necessarily, particularly women who are in new relationships, will not stop using their method. Right. The, the guy does not wear a big C on his forehead. You know, <laughs> so you're not really 100% sure. Right. Uh, they are, by the way, there is a device on that slide um, that came out of some early research looking for sperm-specific antigens in which you can actually do, um, if, if the man will ejaculate into the cup, you can determine how many sperm he has, and you can determine if he has sufficiently low number that he's acceptable. There's <laughs> that to go with, but that may be a little extreme. You might want to save be... that. For... <laughs> That would be I have a little questionnaire I'd like you to fill that. out. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, Theater of Public Policy had some great ideas last night about how to do that. <laughs> There's actually a, a, maybe a related question here that also brings up something that Yuri might be able to speak to from the survey. You touched on it briefly, Dr. Blythe, um, that contraception has been traditionally the responsibility of women, and women have a particular investment in it, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment more on um, what you're finding in your research, or are you finding in your research? Um, anything you'd like to talk about with respect to men's interest in, um, in these procedures, I'm sorry, in these um, contraceptions? Well, there are many stories. Um, there are couples for whom uh, women cannot use a method of contraception for whatever reason, and they are limited to condoms or vasectomy, mm -hmm. which may not be optimal. Uh, and so in some of my slides when I'm uh, talking about the methods for female and I talk about trying to develop safer methods, one of the slides is the safest method for some women may be a male contraceptive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so there is that possibility. Um, I think that men 
may independently want to have protection from fathering a child that didn't intend to father, didn't, didn't want to father. And uh, there, so there, there are many stories, there, there are many reasons. It is hard and interesting to discuss when we're talking about this effectiveness trial in couples, how do we assess the risk-benefit relationship? Because in the female, she's willing to assume a certain amount of risk of the product and side effects of the product because the pregnancy that might result from not using the product has more risk of the same possible bad thing happening like blood clots or uh, pulmonary embolism. But so she wants to avoid the risks of pregnancy and is willing to accept the risk of the drug. Now the man is taking the drug, he has no risk, physical risk of all that. His partner may, so his risk is, you know, what he's willing to tolerate in terms of side effects or health risk for the benefit of his partner. It's a it's an interesting question. It's not an easy one to answer. Mm-hmm. We struggle with it, um, yeah. and the FDA will struggle with it in terms of approving products mm-hmm. that have a certain side effect profile. Mm-hmm. In, in, the, um, in the people that you have treated, do you do, you do surveys to find out what side effects they are oh, willing yes. to accept? And well, we, does that differ we don't do from... so much on the what are you willing to tolerate from a hypothetical method, but when the methods we're actually using, we're trying to get as much information from them about side effects and acceptability as possible. How do you find that the the side effects men are willing to accept differ from those that women accept from side effects of hormonal contraception? Well, I'm not, again, it's very individual and and some people have more tolerance for side effects than others. The the study, there's a very well-known study that was stopped in Europe. uh, it was an injectable method. And by the way, there was an article in the paper that said it was a U.S. study. It was not in the U.S. Oh. It was only in Europe and, and other places. We were not involved in it. Uh, it was stopped because of a concern of a couple of individuals who had severe depression. Mm-hmm. There were The men who were on the study when the study was stopped did not want to stop taking the drug. Eighty-five percent of them said they would be willing to take it if, you know, that's higher than any of the numbers I showed you of acceptability on methods. They really liked it. So whatever side effects they were having, they were certainly willing to tolerate because they were not happy at having to discontinue in the study. I have a contraception question for you. In the light of work in freezing and fertility preservation in a number of contexts, why don't we now, now that we have egg vitrification procedures, routinely just freeze eggs, freeze sperm, have a one-off vasectomy, a one-off tubal ligation <laughs> with minor side effects associated with those once? And I know that there's a generator problem. We need to keep our, our, our liquid nitrogen cold. But um, assuming we have appropriate backup generators, why? presumably that would be cheaper to the healthcare systems and it would be, have far fewer side effects. It would be far less capricious, far would it, less would susceptible. Would it really be cheaper to the healthcare system to have to have all of these samples, everyone in the world, basically? I mean, that's, you're, you're scaling up to vast numbers. I'm not sure that, that we really could possibly do that. Wouldn't you worry you got to mix up in the samples, you know? <laughs> it's bad enough you have to worry about whether or not you're getting the right baby to take home in the hospital, but <laughs> getting it, you know, you're, you're trusting some technician to go and get your sample <laughs> out of some freezer that didn't break down somewhere along the way and freezers break down. I'm more thinking, I just, I'm more thinking you keep your own. Uh, Granny's well, that's even worse. <laughs> Hurricane <laughs> Maria, and you're all wiped out. But no, I think I think you have to. Uh, this is that would be uh, very futuristic, uh, and I don't know. But I do wish, uh, you know, on a on a more serious note, I wish the fertility preservation really field talked a lot more. Talk about silos to the contraceptive field mm-hmm. because they're really in the same business. And they're just not talking to one another. And the idea of turning the egg into suspended animation until you want it Mm -hmm. to work, instead of having those eggs just dying away every month from 
you know, in utero to mm -hmm. adulthood, it would be nice to be able to just control that whole process, which is what fertility preservation people are trying and to if, do. And if you were freezing your gametes young, you would also have less of a problem of delayed childbearing. How young are you going to plan to get these things out of these poor girls? <laughs> we, we would ask <laughs> Professor Murdoch, what's the optimal age? Well, that's the problem. Some of these children undergoing chemotherapy, and there's you have your to make mitzvah. that decision very young, and they, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not an easy procedure yeah. to get those eggs out of them. Yeah. So. I, think, I think the bottom line, you have to remember that having babies the natural way is actually much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and it is actually what most people do and want to do, and we really need to be careful that we just don't get it too technical. I, I have concerns about the egg freezing issue. Mm -hmm. um, it was developed as a technology because young women were having cancer treatment and the cancer treatment was making them infertile. And whereas for men in that situation, we could freeze their sperm, we couldn't do anything for women. And so we said, okay, now we've developed the ways we can freeze eggs, we can freeze their eggs, and we can give them a chance when they survive their cancer treatment to have a normal life and a normal family. And that then has become, probably for commercial reasons, into the social sector, and we end up with social freezing. I don't like that at all. It's not common in the UK. It's certainly not part of the NHS system. Um, just technically for a start, it's a very bad insurance policy. Remember what I said to you about abnormalities, how likely it is that eggs are going to be genetically abnormal. So if you have a batch of eggs frozen, say you do one cycle and you have an average maybe eight eggs frozen, your chance of a baby is probably not that high. Would you take out an insurance policy that will only pay out 25% of the times so if your house burns down? You probably wouldn't. You'd want 100% guarantee on that. So realistically, if you want to do it, you're going to have a lot to, free to freeze a lot more eggs. You're going to have to freeze 10, 20 eggs to give you a really a reasonable chance, which means going through more than one pickup procedure. Um, the whole question, as you say, about storing eggs, keeping them, I, we really, I think we really have to be careful not to get the whole thing too technical and, and reserve IVF and the technology for people who really need it. And can I question you, can I come back to your question about contraception? Because in the UK, it's, a, it's a, an issue I've raised in the UK as well. The clinics that deal with contraception are actually called family planning clinics. Now, family planning is not about not having babies. It's about having babies when you decide not to use contraception. So there is a very clear mixed between the two. And it comes back to something I was saying yesterday about date, about times. And there should be some instruction when you take your contraception about discussion about, well, when are you going to have your family? It's, part, it's all part of the same process. And I would tend to agree with you as well that, you know, a good communication, um, that level is, is really quite important. Mm -hmm. Just to add another, um, I read an article the other day about hyper ovarian stimulation syndrome or hi ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And as another kind of wrinkle to the whole, like, oh, just freeze your eggs. It's not actually that simple a process. And then also kind of medically as well. Yes. Well, you wouldn't need okay, to you're getting into a slightly technical. There is a condition called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is a complication. To do IVF, you need more than one egg. That just increases your chances statistically. So you give women medication. And on average, you're going to produce about 10 follicles. And you're going to get about eight eggs from that. There are some women who have ovaries that are just stuffed full of eggs. We call them polycystic ovaries. <laughs> They're really, really super ovaries. They're being medicalized as being problems, but actually these, these, are, these are wonder women. Um, when you super ovulate them, they can have 20, 30, 40, 50 eggs. And if you collect all those eggs and you do the procedure, their, eggs, their ovaries can become very swollen. They can, get, they can get metabolic problems that can be quite serious. Mm -hmm. and to some people's um, practice is then to make embryos and freeze the eggs, and freeze the embryos or make, keep the freeze the eggs at that stage, stop all the treatment, let everything settle down and bring them back and put the embryos back uh, at a later stage. It is a, it is a side effect of IVF, mm -hmm. but the risk of it for someone who doesn't have super ovaries is extremely low, okay. less than 1%. Mm -hmm. For a woman that does have super ovaries, it's one of those risks you tell them about. You say, this is the risk you're going to take. Do you want to go through treatment? Right. For instance, we would not take someone as, an, as a volunteer egg donor 
who had that risk because the risk is too high for them. But if someone wants to get pregnant, then they want to get pregnant. Right? You know? um, we had a question come in um, with someone would like to know if there was any religious pushback to some of the legislation that you were talking about in the UK, because I think you know, that's something that sort of would certainly be an issue in the US. OK. Um, we are very fortunate in the UK that not only is it there's not, there, there are religious views, but it's not a party political view. So when there's been debates in Parliament, they have not had you know, a three-line whip from the parties, so people can vote on their conscience, not along a party line, which means that, that legislation hasn't bounced backwards depending on who's in power at any particular time, and that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are religious groups who campaign against uh, cystic reception techniques and a lot of the reproductive techniques of mitochondrial transfer that we discuss. Um, they, vo they lobby loudly. Um, they heckle at meetings. They have a voice. I don't have a problem with them having a voice. They have a say. But they are a minority. Um, and in the debates that have gone to parliaments in terms of regulation and legislation, they don't, their voice has not taken priority. Mm -hmm. There has been debate about whether there should be someone with these views on the regulatory authority. And that's been an interesting debate. The chair of the authority has always had the view that there isn't much point in having such a person sitting on the authority because they would always go vote against everything in principle. So the views of these people are, tend to be taken into account in, in light of con consultations that they do. So if they're going to, for instance, they, when we did the mitochondrial stuff before they decided to allow us to put in an application, they held a public consultation and they took written evidence. So that was the time at which people who had those views could put their views forward to them, but they don't actually formally sit on the authority. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and there was another question as well. Um, actually, um, someone from the, the audience here was wondering about, um, you know, so how does it work for people who are doing work in, in other fields, you know, like can you could could you, for example, move to the U.S. and do work here, or like you know, is there like a, a researchers without borders kind of situation, or how does that work in terms of different there, countries' policies? There, there are some, there are some groups. There's the Hickston Group, which is an international group in Cambridge, which has looked at some of these issues, these cross-border issues. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are difficult because ethics is not absolute. Moral issues are not absolute. So what might be ethical in one country might not be ethical in another country. Mm -hmm. And when you can you do clinical trials, that obviously is something that you need to take into account. Um, scientists move between different countries to do different research, and patients move to between different countries to access treatment that might not be available uh, in one country or another. So those rules and regulations if you're making the rules and regulations, you have to think about the consequences. If the consequences is you're going to drive your top scientists to work in a different country, mm -hmm. who's benefiting? Mm -hmm. um, there are more difficult questions about your top scientist goes from here, does work, say, in the UK, gets lots of prizes, comes back to US, where what they're doing might be illegal. Mm -hmm. How is their community going to regard them? Um, are they going to accept the fact that they have done work that's illegal in this country. Lots of big issues there. But the reality is that scientists move around. You know, it's not too difficult to get in an aeroplane. It's more difficult to get work visa. But if you're going with a research grant, it's not usually that difficult. Right. So another thing to think about in terms of the, the structures that we put in place, right? How, how does that impact the opportunities for, for researchers and, and what you're allowing to happen or not allow can impact that. Well, as I mentioned, yes. our male contraceptive trials being done on four continents right. uh, in quite a few different countries. And that's an exciting opportunity because we hope to get different perspectives as, you know, in terms of acceptability and usage mm -hmm. from the different cultures. All right, so potential global impact, right, for male contraception and um, its one of availability. The we, one of the things we spoke about in our student session yesterday with respect to transnational research is, again, thinking about the structures and how the knowledge moves, how the products move, and how if we look at, um, you know, the outsourcing of research and clinical trial research around the world, we see a pattern in which um, researchers need often populations that are not already stuffed with drugs, like in the U.S., so what we call <laughs> naive populations that... So 
often the work of Adrian and Petrina has shown that what happens is um, we use different populations as clinical trial subjects, but often the power dynamics and the economic dynamics are such that these very same um, people don't have access to whatever the results are of the research. So they're test subjects, but not then able to consume or take part in the medical advances that happen. And so part of what we have to think about is that power dynamic, mm -hmm. that yes, we want to think about sort of lowering the borders of research, but that might mean being able right. for us in the West to be able to go and move and do things, but then the economic imperatives mean that then there are very high walls for people to access what is developed. And so we need to think about that, that uh, dynamic. But that's actually true for um, any clinical trial of an investigational product yeah. that, whether it's in the U.S. Or, or any other country that I know of, the people who participate in the clinical trial, when the trial ends, do not get to continue to use the drug. And right. we've had times when people have said, please, yes, can we continue absolutely. to use the drug? We really like it. Yeah. Uh, that there is compassionate use, but that's a rare phenomenon, yeah. and so... No, I think that's a, a good point, that it's not even the only a factor of doing things across borders, but for people here. Mm -hmm. And we know that even for the human subjects research here, there are class dynamics involved in terms of people being professional clinical trial subjects, that is going from trial to trial because you right. get stipends, and right. so there's class dynamics that then are you able to, to benefit from the things that you're participating in. Yeah, we've in. had right. two, two sites in New York in which an individual will enroll in both sites yeah. trying to, you know, that takes a bit of doing to discover. But it is, it, it's a problem, but we are so grateful to the volunteers. I mean, you put up with a little bit of, of that because if we don't have volunteers, we never develop anything new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, beyond being grateful, what other benefits should trial participants be, uh, you know, privy to, right? And we so, can't get very much money in right. our studies because we don't want it to be coercive. Right. And so it's, it really is a volunteer act of, right. you know, wanting to help and benefit and contribute. If, if anyone's interested in it, the Nuffield Council did um, a report a couple of years ago on human bodies which is about donating, um, it was in the clinical scenario, donating kidneys and things, but also donating for clinical research and looking at in detail at all the ethical issues that were involved. So if people are interested in that area, I would suggest it might be a, a, a report that would be worth reading. Yeah. And so then um, this actually leads us to another question that an audience member had um, with regard to, to access and health insurance. I mean, you know, would male contraceptives, you know, um, of the kinds that are in the pipeline, would they be covered under health insurance? About how much do you think it would cost? Is this something that actually, you know, people around the world or that, that would be accessible? Because, I mean, even the contraceptive options available today for women, access is an issue. So mine is even new things, and so. Well, so if I rule the world, right. <laughs> insurance will be available to everybody. That, and in fact, the drugs would be available to everybody at no charge. Right. However, um, it will be a new product. I'm sure in the beginning there will be more restrictions on it than methods that have been out in the field for forever and ever. But hopefully, it will be something that will be available because we're testing it around the world. We hope to have the ability to have approval in multiple regulatory areas mm -hmm. uh, someday. I hope it would be covered by insurance. Uh, you know, I, in our current environment, we're not sure what's going to be covered by insurance in the near future, but yeah. we would expect it to be. And if it were to be covered by insurance, would it start out like, you know, really expensive in the beginning, but maybe a number of years down the road, it starts to get cheaper? Or would it kind of debut at a, a reasonable? I think, well, I don't, I don't understand all those marketing uh, calculations, <laughs> but it seems to me that if it's too expensive, it won't get used. And right. therefore, the, op the belief is it has to be affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? No? I, I've, I had to, oh, go, Jacob. I've got one thing that um, came up in both of the talks this morning, um, which I thought might be interesting to discuss, which is sort of expectation management around science. Both of you mm. sort of discussed how long it takes to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think 
especially these days, we're used to a new iPhone coming out every single year, and we can <laughs> see technological progress happening from year to year to year. Biology is not nearly that fast. Um, and so I just sort of wanted to maybe open up for discussion. You know, these programs are the result of decades of hard, decades. frankly, boring kind of slogs through science and a lot of failure and a lot of trial. And then suddenly something big happens. And certainly, you know, with, with CRISPR, it's, it's this big hype machine, but it's nowhere near as advanced as anything that we heard about this morning. So, you know, it's something that I sort of wanted to open up for discussion on the panel. Um, how can we as scientists maybe communicate with people what, how science actually works and how it eventually gets translated to, commu to changing people's lives? So when I get asked for interviews, uh, I start out with the reporters, and they're all very enthusiastic, and I get them really depressed by the end. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to take me four years to get this trial finished on a product that's in phase 2B, not even phase 2A, but phase 2B studies of clinical stuff. And then, if that all works really well, I get to start all over again on a phase 3, which the FDA usually wants two phase 3 large studies. The, I told you about the 20,000 cycles for women. Well, that's about 2,000 women using the product for a year, so that's a really large trial for men. And it's going to be you know, at least 10 years for a product that's already so far advanced in clinical trials. So when I say they, something exciting happens in a mouse and they talk about five years, I just laugh at them because they're not even going to see a patient for at least 10 to 15 years, most likely, if it's a drug, if it's a systemic drug. Mm -hmm. If it's a device, possibly it might be faster. Mm -hmm. But for a systemic drug, you need to have a huge body of safety in animals before you can expose men or women to so the product. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, because people have been asking, women have had, you know, like the um, birth control options for 50 years, and so, like, why don't men have it? And, and so we hear you saying that it takes a really long time. When did people start asking the question, like, hey, we should develop this for men? Back in 1961 in prisons, mm -hmm. you know, it was yeah. going on. They were, <laughs> I mean, they were obviously considering it at that point. So mm -hmm. it's about the same time the pill came out for women they were recognizing that there might be ways of controlling sperm production in men, right. and people were interested in it. But it is a very hard thing to have a, pro a drug that doesn't have side effects. And again, sometimes you don't find out those side effects until you get into humans and then something serendipitous happens. So. And how long did it take from kind of, you know, beginning-ish to the end point for the, the, the female pill? What was that timeline like? Like how long were they working on that it before was, they were able to? It was to... about 20 years, I think. About 20 uh, years. So then for a male contraceptive pill, because the process is so much more complicated, it's taken a lot longer and will continue to take a while? Well, or... I, I think there has been the challenge of the oral contraceptive mm -hmm. for, for testosterone. And, and we haven't been get, able to get away from that using the methods that we know exist you know, the progestins that we know we can give orally, but we still have to replace the testosterone somehow. The popularity of the gel has actually been very surprising. I don't think anybody realized how popular the various testosterone gels were going to be in the U.S., but they are a multi-billion dollar um, mm -hmm. enterprise now. Mm -hmm. So, and, and men like them. They, they find them acceptable to use. Mm -hmm. In some ways, the... Um, the, the contraceptive regimen could have some health benefits in that because you're supplying testosterone exogenously uh, at a very uh, constant level that it will make for more energy and more alertness and more better muscle maintenance and so forth. I mean, there are some potential advantages to making sure that the testosterone is in the normal range, even at the same time that you're suppressing the sperm production in the testes. Right. So, so that perhaps yeah. answers another uh, right. viewer's question, which was, could there be uh, therapeutic secondary uses for male contraception yeah. the way that there are for... We always uh, would love to pill. have health benefits, uh, the potential for some of the molecules that I was talking about, where we're talking, the DMAU, 
uh, they do not get converted into the 5-alpha reductase uh, product that causes male pattern baldness. So there's the potential for that. But not, not that that's not a good thing. That male <laughs> don't want don't to get into any kind of <laughs> criticism here. But the, 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 and I mentioned um, the nesterone makes you smarter because one of the things that nesterone seems to be doing is it, it is uh, working to stimulate myelin regeneration and possibly in some diseases where myelin regeneration would be a good thing to, to protect. But they, in the process of doing that, they put rats in a maze and the rats that were treated with the nesterone did better than the rats on the placebo. So my story is it makes you smarter <laughs> and therefore. At least if you're amazed follower. Yeah. <laughs> Getting to the cheese, it's going right. to be. <laughs> um, and there's also a really interesting question that relates to um, uh, something that we know that you're interested in just from your, your web page, and, and, um, but that we haven't talked about in, in this conference, is concern about the environmental impacts of more hormones in the water supply. So I know that you um, are involved in kind of green contraception initiatives, yeah. and it kind of links back to previous Nobel conferences and future ones about kind of the environment and things like that. And I wonder if you could just take a couple of minutes to tell us about that, because until I read that on your website, I was like, oh, right. <laughs> so... So ethanol estradiol is the uh, synthetic estrogen that is in most f combined female hormonal contraceptives. And it is a very, very powerful hormone. It's between 150 to 700 times more potent than natural estradiol. And it's not broken down, so it's excreted mostly intact. And it can get into the water supply. And the, Sometimes, uh, if you're monitoring the rivers, the levels can get up high enough that it would be detrimental to the fish that are in those waters and can cause the fish to feminize, and then you don't get the next generation of fish. That's a bad thing. And the only source of it is from hormonal contraceptives. Ethanol estradiol works really well for the purpose of some of the reasons it was put there in the first place in terms of controlling bleeding while taking the progestin that's controlling ovulation, but it's not necessarily the best molecule, and we're looking at ways to replace it with natural estradiol, which is broken down and would not be as toxic to the water. Um, so I think that in the future, the world will hopefully move toward a greener contraceptive method. What we're talking about here are not molecules that have those same kind of toxic uh, expectations. Mm -hmm. So we, we think it will be better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big fan of ethanol estradiol, but it's, that's what's in all the products and it's hard to get it out. Right, well, works well. Thank you for thinking of all these other things. <laughs> um, any final questions or comments before we break for lunch? Do you have any? I would just remind you that I'm looking at the schedule, and we officially begin at 1.30. However, the musical prelude is at 1.15, mm -hmm. an invitation to visit some of the many exhibits. And yes, there will be free cookies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for a great Thank you very much. <laughs>